What makes this so problematic is the FDA has banned three parent embryos. But what happens when you have a sperm and an egg who's created a child and then they put it into a third woman's body and DNA. And there's this fascinating process called fetal microchimerism, where a mother and her child actually share genetic material. Um, and so this is actually for the benefit of the baby and for the benefit of a mother. So there's this really cool case, um, a really sad case that's tracked throughout a lot of like medical journals where a woman had an abortion around 20 weeks um, and like got rid of the child, right? About 20 years later, she had liver cancer and the doctors were able to track that the baby cells left over from the baby she aborted 20 years before actually helped rebuild her liver because it's in the best interest of the baby to help the mother um, live, right? So if there's an injury, they send all the cells there to help. Mm -hmm. But when it comes with surrogacy, it gets really problematic because it means that children are being born with DNA from three different parents, mm -hmm. including the surrogate mom. Mm -hmm. And so this tends to lead to really high risk pregnancies for the surrogate um, and then complications for the child. So higher risk of cancer, higher risk of autism um, and other things that we're just now starting to actually study. Mm -hmm. um, so like on the ethical level, on the medical level, lots of problems with even just how surrogacy functions um, as a concept. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment. And this week, I'm alone once more, uh, even though uh, the topic we talk about on today's show is all about babies. Uh, we uh, don't have Nick because he is raising his own. He's on paternity leave right now. Not really. He's working really hard for us regardless, but from West Virginia, where he's spending quality time with his lovely wife, Evie and Margot Solheim. Uh, he'll be back for season three, Fear Not. Uh, uh, we had on today uh, a fantastic guest, uh, one that might be familiar to you guys, someone who used to work at American Moment, actually. And it's sort of wild for me to think about the fact that our organization has been around long enough that there is a set of people who used to work for us. Uh, but Emma Waters is a research associate in the Richard and Helen DeVos Center for Life, Religion, and Family at the Heritage Foundation. And we just taped uh, one of the most horrifying episodes of Moment of Truth uh, we've ever had. I'll explain in a second why. But before that, uh, go to AmericanMoment.org. There you can find everything we have cooking as an organization, events that are upcoming, the backlog of this show, Amcan and our coalition of books, essays, podcasts, YouTube videos, short pieces, and more, talking about all the different issues we care about and programs and applications for those programs that we have. Have upcoming. Uh, what did we talk about with this episode with Emma? Well, honestly, the, the backstory behind it, and I say this when, when we start the show as well, was that um, I was at a uh, going away party for a friend of ours, um, and Emma and I got to talking about this latest piece of research she was about to put out on commercial surrogacy, specifically the intersection of international commercial sur surrogacy and Chinese nationals. And I proceeded to get more and more and more horrified <laughs> over the course of the you know 30 minutes or so we talked about it. And I was a little tipsy. It was late, you know, Friday night. We were we were, we were having a few drinks and and um you know, I, I just was was compelled to hear more about it. So I told her, let's come on the show and talk about it. And I can confirm that it had nothing to do with my state of inebriation. It is truly a horrifying topic. We spent well over an hour talking about it, and there's probably more to be discussed. Uh, but it's just a, a fascinating niche policy area that Emma's done yeoman's work digging into and will continue to do so that I think you'll be fascinated. If you care about immigration, if you care about natural law, if you care about uh, the life issue, if you care about the way we look at technology in the 21st century, if you care about basically any uh, element of public policy, I think you'll find something interesting to know about here. It's at the very least an extremely under-indexed issue in public policy and in D.C. So hopefully you'll uh, enjoy the wrong word, but you'll find fascinating the discussion we're about to have. We'll go now to Emma Waters. Emma, thank you for coming back on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me back. You used to be on this side of the desk, so this is fascinating. And the the story behind how this came up is, so you've been at the Heritage Foundation for the past couple of months doing, doing awesome work there, and you and I got to talking at a bar recently about um, this story that you were working on uh, having to do, well, I'll let you tell the story. Uh, what exactly is it that, that you've discovered is going on with uh, our nation's surrogacy laws, and uh, what can we do about it? 
Yeah, so in the United States, um, we have something called commercial surrogacy, which is effectively a purchasing parent or parents paying to rent the womb of a woman. So she gestates the child, she births the child. So we have this domestically, but we also in California, in Illinois, New York, and a few particular states have very lax international commercial surrogacy laws. So a couple of months ago, I came across this brief NPR story that highlighted uh, uh, the rise in Chinese nationals contracting with American surrogates to bear children for them in the United States. Wow. Okay, so I have a thousand different questions. I, I actually want to dive a little bit into how surrogacy works because it's one of those things that we don't really talk about much in American society, but the second you start asking questions, it all just becomes super dark sounding. So first of all, when did surrogacy come about? And, and first of all, like, when people talk about surrogacy, there's like a couple different things that we could be talking about, right? Like people talk about surrogacy where one parent is donating uh, the mother of the of the baby the, the, the person who just tastes the baby is also the genetic mother of the baby whereas there's um, a, a donor contributing sperm like it just lay out to me the couple different forms of, of surrogacy in the United States right now yes so it's important to distinguish between altruistic surrogacy um, or like compassionate surrogacy mm -hmm. and this is what pe people typically think of when they think of surrogacy so in this instance think of a nice Christian couple who's genuinely infertile they've been trying to have kids for a decade and just can't in all altruistic surrogacy, it would be the mother's um, sister or one of her best friends who volunteers to actually carry the embryo from this married couple um, to bear the child and like give them the opportunity to have a kid. Mm -hmm. um, and so while there are still many health concerns and even ethical concerns with that kind of surrogacy, it's not the thing that we're talking about when we mm -hmm. say commercial surrogacy. Mm -hmm. And those embryos are, are created via IVF. Yeah. So right. yeah. So think like the entire in vitro fertilization um, lab process that really came up. I think like as early as the eighties, seventies um, or eighties, mm -hmm. with like Baby M, who was the first child who was born from IVF. Um, but that's how the process of modern commercial surrogacy has really developed. Mm -hmm. um, so now it's actually against the law, pretty much everywhere, for the surrogate mom to also be the biological mom of the child. Wow, it's um, against the law. Against the law, because. Why? it turns out that the process of gestating a child is incredibly intimate, right? Mm -hmm. And so there were multiple um, cases in New Jersey and in other states where a woman would be the uh, biological mother. So she wouldn't have sex with the man, right? But it would still be her egg that they used in creating the embryo, like the father's sperm. Um, but then she would become so emotionally attached to the child that when the child was born, she would refuse to give it over to the parents. Mm -hmm. And because uh, this sort of reproductive technology is so new, even now we barely have laws governing it, but especially back in the 90s, for example, it was just handled as custody law. So they're looking at this child that's genetically belongs to the mom, genetically belongs to this other dad married to another woman, and then it would end up in weird situations where the surrogate mom would have visitation hours with this other couple's baby, because it's technically her child, right? And this is just what makes it so bizarre. So they finally just made it illegal for the surrogate carrying the child to be related. But was that a federal law or was that state level? State by state. Okay. So it was kind of just like consensus. And a lot of times surrogacy agencies themselves, the ones who are helping contract this relationship between the purchasing parents and the surrogate, um, won't allow it either because it just means a legal headache for almost everyone involved. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, what makes this so problematic is the FDA has banned three parent embryos. But what happens when you have a sperm and an egg who's created a child and then they put it into a third woman's body and DNA. And there's this fascinating process called fetal microchimerism, where a mother and her child actually share genetic material. Um, and so this is actually for the benefit of the baby and for the benefit of a mother. So there's this really cool case, um, a really sad case that's tracked throughout a lot of like medical journals where a woman had an abortion around 20 weeks um, and like got rid of the child, right? About 20 years later, she had liver cancer and the doctors were able to track that the baby cells left over from the baby she aborted 20 years before actually helped rebuild her liver because it's in the best interest of the baby to help the mother um, live, right? So if there's an injury, they send all the cells there to help. Mm -hmm. But when it comes with surrogacy, 
it gets really problematic because it means that children are being born with DNA from three different parents, Mm -hmm. including the surrogate mom. Mm -hmm. And so this tends to lead to really high risk pregnancies for the surrogate um, and then complications for the child. So higher risk of cancer, higher risk of autism um, and other things that we're just now starting to actually study. Mm -hmm. Um, So like on the ethical level, on the medical level, lots of problems with even just how surrogacy functions um, as a concept. But you said that the FDA has banned um, three parent children. What's the way to have a three parent child if not through that process? Yeah. And that's the problem. So it's technically not three embryos being um, created in the lab, which is the distinction, but there's still genetic material being shared. Mm -hmm. So the distinction you have to make when you talk about commercial surrogacy, if you're doing it honestly, Mm -hmm. is that the mother and the child may not be biologically related, but they are genetically connected. Mm -hmm. um, Even if there's no other relationship Mm -hmm. from mother to child. Mm -hmm. No, I'm asking like, what's the procedure that was banned that would have created three parent children? So yeah, that, Yeah, so that would have been, I mean, that would have been like actual IVF lab where you're trying to take composite parts from multiple individuals. I see. Um, Yeah, and that just is a nightmare to say Mm -hmm. the least. Yeah, I can imagine. So, okay, the commercial surrogacy becomes possible sometime in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. How has the industry evolved over time? I mean, well, so the technology to do surrogacy period comes into existence. Um, What was the sort of uptake in the American population? Was it really frequent at all? And and has there been some sort of hockey, hockey stick spike? Yeah, so it's certainly been growing in prominence since then, but um, it's an incredibly expensive process. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you want to contract um, a commercial surrogacy agreement, especially with how our laws in most states function today, um, you're looking at about four or five different parties that are involved. Um, So the way I like to frame it is the child um, has to look at these adults and say, like, are you my mother? Mm -hmm. And like actually figure out who it is, because on the one hand, you need a sperm and an egg. So maybe that comes from the couple, but contrary to the happy image of altruistic surrogacy that I painted, a lot of the uptick in surrogacy has to do with either same-sex gay men who want a child or single women. Um, two of the most problematic parts of today's society, um, to say the least. And so in many of these instances, they're having to either purchase sperm or purchase an egg. Then they're having to pay an IVF lab to create the embryo. Mm -hmm. And I think many people know the concerns with the IVF industry. Um, So this means like embryos that are discarded, embryos that are frozen and like just perpetually. So there was a story and I think the Washington Post just last week of a 20 year old embryo that had been frozen for 20 years then like brought to like bir- like gestated and then birthed recently so if you believe that life begins at conception um like i do and like millions of christians and religious folks do on the right then this is a child who is conceived in a lab through a very unnatural process and then it's just left in this like waiting game not being developed as is proper um and in many instances not actually being destroyed And so this is technically a 20-year-old embryo that is now starting its life as an infant, which is so bizarre. So and so there's embryo destruction, there's embryo freezing. And then on top of that, the percentage of IVF created children that are actually viable, that actually take root in the pregnancy, that are actually born safely is incredibly low. Like Mm -hmm. we're talking like 15 percent or lower. Mm -hmm. Um, So the entire industry itself is just very complicated there. Um, But as our technology has gotten better and is developed more um yeah it's become more popular so then incredibly expensive so you still have to buy a sperm or egg you have to create the embryo in a lab you then if if you're a gay couple or a single man you then you must use a surrogate right like you need a womb um so this is not a problem for a lot of single women or like lesbian couples Mm -hmm. but so so question um obviously in ivf uh the rates of implant successful implantation are, are often low uh, and in order to sometimes maximize the chances of a successful implantation they try to implant multiple embryos at once which yeah. leads to twins triplets how does that work in commercial surrogacy are they still uh keeping the same risk tolerance for for multiple kids and if so uh, does that complicate the contract how does that 
How does yeah. that all work? No, it's a great question. And this is why uh, commercial surrogacy will never be pro-life um, and is not a pro-family option uh, because you do have very high rates of triplets um, or twins with IVF. And so in nearly every surrogacy contract, um, and I have examples of these from California and other places showing it, uh, they have something called the termination of life clause. And so what this means is that if the purchasing parents, um, for whatever reason, but particularly due to like multiple children in the womb, decide that they don't want all of the kids or they can't afford all of the kids, then the surrogate is required to reduce one of the fetuses, um, have an abortion, kill the baby, right? Um, so there are really heartbreaking stories of surrogates who then conceive triplets, right? And the parent or parents say, well, we can't afford triplets, we can't take ter- care of triplets, like, you need to go find out which are the two most viable and then get rid of the other. And if a surrogate refuses to do so, because either she didn't read the contract closely or she didn't think that it would happen to her, right? Um, She can be in violation of her contract. So there are instances then where she refuses to get an abortion, but then she doesn't actually get the amount of money owed to her from the contract and she's left with the child to raise. Mm -hmm. So this child is just getting passed off to like whatever adult can take care of it. Is there any contractual process by which they can compel an abortion? Um, Yes, it gets complicated to what degree. In the United States, especially in California, um, there is a pretty big push for surrogate autonomy at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that usually comes down to their ability to reject a C-section at birth. Mm. In foreign countries, um, their in foreign countries, informed consent is nearly non-existent, um, which is why India, Nepal, Thailand, and others have actually banned international commercial surrogacy, because a lot of the women were then effectively being forced into abortions. Um, and that we can track a little bit more than the United States. But I mean, if you're getting paid sixty to $80,000 um, to gestate someone else's child, and you desperately need the money, and then they tell you that you're not going to get paid unless you get an abortion, like that seems like a pretty hefty form of coercion at mm. the same time. So legally, they might not be required to get an abortion, but they would also lose out on all the funds, which is... Would they be allowed to potentially keep one of the triplets or two of the triplets if they so chose? Are, are there ways to ban someone from being able to keep the kids? Uh, not that I know of. Okay. That would depend. And you, in most of the cases I've read about, they're kind of required to keep the child because mm-hmm. there's no one else that the child could belong to if the purchasing mm-hmm. parents no longer want them. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, so keep keep going on the the different parties. I just yeah. found that that thought immediately. Yeah, disturbing. no, it's yeah, incredibly disturbing. Um, so yeah, so we have the are you my mother framework, right? So if you need to purchase the egg or the sperm, you have to create it in the lab. Um, you have to rent a room, womb if you're a man or you don't want to gestate as the woman. Um, and then on top of that, you have the surrogacy agency that's contracting this relationship, making sure that it's legally quote unquote above the board mm-hmm. um, or ethical, even though they're. There's no actual like ethical guidelines like helping regulate this. Mm -hmm. And even if there were, it still would not be a good process. Mm -hmm. Um, And I assume those agencies primarily crop up to source catalogs of potential mothers. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of different ways that they'll um, uh, that they advertise and like particular groups that they're advertising for in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's kind of like the four party process. Mm -hmm. And then if all goes according to plan, absolute best case scenario, um, the surrogate births a child. And then depending on the state's laws, it goes to the parents. So in California, which is the most permissive in promoting commercial surrogacy, they have something called the Uniform Parentage Act um, that they established in 2013. And so that effectively says that uh, you can establish the paternity even if there's no genetic or biological connection between the purchasing parent or parents and the child. Um, Before the birth of the child, they have like a legal process you follow. Um, And so when the child is born, it's actually the purchasing parents who go on the birth certificate, not the surrogate. Um, So this is also where like a lot of the concerns of like the erasure of motherhood and the erasure of the woman come in. Mm. Um, So you saw like the New York photo shoot, right? Of like the gay couple who's like celebrating the child they've conceived. And in the background, you see like a blurry woman in a womb. And they're like, wow, look, we're having a child. And you're like, no, you're literally erasing women like right before us. Um, And and that's kind of the dynamic. What are you doing in that hospital bed, Mr. Buttigieg? (laughs) Yeah, exactly, exactly. Please tell me how the labor process went for you because I have a lot of questions about that. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Uh, what's the profile of these women who opt in to potentially be surrogate mothers? Where, where do they come from? What is their socioeconomic background typically? Why do they do it? Have yeah. there been uh, profiles of, of people who go into this kind of work? Yeah. So there's, I'd say like two different kinds of women that you're looking at here. Um, and some surrogacy agencies that I've spoken to said that they will not work with a surrogate unless she is like a middle class income. Um, to what degree that is actually true and to what degree they actually regulate that, I have a lot of questions about. And I, th I think that's more of the exception rather than the rule. Mm -hmm. um, because what you have is you either have um, women who are basically professional surrogates. So about once a year, every two years, they enter into a contract, make between sixty and $80,000, and like that is their full-time job. Um, these women, uh, because they're like explicitly engaging in it for the money, um, have led to a lot of really hard heartbreaking stories like one that a labor and delivery nurse talked about in California um, with Chinese nationals parents who were like actually like married couple infertile truly wanted kids but because the surrogate was like a professional surrogate was in it for the money um, when it came time to deliver they couldn't naturally deliver the child and so the doctors basically told her like the only way this child will live is if you have a c-section um, but for the surrogate uh, your birthing stats if you will matter a lot for your hireability and how much you can make on future contracts so the surrogate actually refused to get a c-section and the child died within her while the parents who were biologically like like the biological parents watch this happen. So this is like the horrendous and heartbreaking side of it where this labor and delivery nurse is looking at this woman and like they're doing everything they can within the law to compel her to get a C-section to save the life of this child she's carried. But because it's purely a business for her, it would only quote unquote hurt her to do it. So that's one side of it. The other side of it would be um, women who were either military wives, um, lower income, it's typically lower income or either like military wives um, where this is actually a really big issue. Um, so is that because like not a lot of work on base and this is just like one of those things that's easy yeah, for those women to you're do? You're moving every couple of years, so it's mm -hmm. hard to get a consistent job. Mm -hmm. Your husband's gone for nine or 10 months out of the year. so not that you don't have much else to do right yeah. um and tricare insurance is incredibly good and mm. so turns out they can get really great benefits for being pregnant and never have to disclose that's a surrogate child um so this is actually a huge problem when it comes to our military insurance um and then you which have the taxpayer pays for right which right. yeah which america literally funds which is a big problem um you have um and then you have like low-income women and so like the, one of the best ways um, of illustrating this is actually in new york so up until 2021 commercial surrogacy was totally illegal in the state of new york um, which might surprise you because they tend to be pretty progressive on most things um, but there was a state senator who um was in a gay marriage is in a gay marriage um, and he and his husband really wanted to have children but they were being forced quote unquote quote, to fly all the way to California to contract with women, because even though commercial surrogacy was illegal in New York, altruistic surrogacy was always legal. So a woman doing it out of the kindness of her heart. But in New York, they couldn't find enough women who were willing to be surrogates um, for for good means. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like with altruistic surrogacy, they would pay for insurance, but the women would break even. So the women wouldn't pay any medical bills, but they wouldn't make any money off of it either. How is that? realistically speaking legally enforced i mean i'm sure there was money going under the table yes there can be money going under the table the contracts are generally uh, oh i see so in order for it to be legally like yeah something has to be on the page in order to ensure right. that you can get the custody and right right and so, so like you still yeah so there's still contracts there's still like some sort of like enforcement or overseeing mm -hmm. um and also like to be able to afford to hire a surrogate, you have to be of a particular like wealth status because it's so expensive. Yeah. And the last thing you need is like, you know, $80,000 going missing in your books. Like yeah. there's ways that kind of like moderates yeah. itself, but all that to say, so they couldn't find a woman willing to do it altruistically. So, and they were tired of traveling to California to create children with another woman um, and like rent her womb. So they pushed- Sorry, they were tired of it as in they had had one or two kids already and they yeah. wanted more? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Right. Uh, And so then they did sort of this like puff campaign in New York, talked about all the like really sweet benefits of like commercial surrogacy um, and then passed it in 2021. But what this tells us is that women were not willing to be surrogates out of the kindness of their heart. The process wasn't worth it to them. Um, High risk complications, emotionally very Mm -hmm. difficult, ethically problematic. Right. Like I think natural law sort of tells us that there's something not good about this process. But if they're willing to do it for high rates of money, then it means that they're tapping into an audience of women who needs the money. So financially uh, poor in some sort of like dire situation where they need an influx of cash in the next year. Right. Um, But we ban organ selling along the same lines. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 the funny distinction is that there there seems to be a general sense in America that that selling organs is bad and we shouldn't legalize that. Um, I haven't seen a lot of agitating from leftists on that yet, but this doesn't trigger the same mentality from people. No, it does among feminists. Feminists really hate commercial surrogacy because it exploits women. Um, But at the same time, there's really weird swaths of the population from like liberals to sympathetic folks who are big fans. But it does raise an interesting question, right? Like what is the actual line? Like if you're breaking it down between a legitimate commercial surrogacy agreement and then say a man purchasing an egg using a sperm purchasing the womb of a woman and then creating a child between like, like what is different between that and like baby selling, right? Right. Like if you purchase all the composite parts, make it in a lab and then have it like delivered to you, how is that effectively different than baby selling Mm -hmm. or organ selling, right? There's not a compelling case Mm -hmm. to actually show the distinction between the two. Right. Um, But that's effectively what many of our commercial surrogacy agreements are. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you said the number is about sixty to eighty thousand is typically how this runs for domestic. That's how much a surrogate would and, make, and, and that's the like cash in hand, or is that like they would pay for insurance out of their own pocket, or how does that all work? It's a good question. That would depend on the actual contract breakdown mm-hmm. um, that they agree upon, mm-hmm. but typically you're looking at most of that cash in hand. Okay, and so what what is the like the modal woman, or maybe the the mean woman who does surrogacy? How often do they do it? So to be a viable surrogate, you have to have you have to have birthed one child naturally yourself. Oh, interesting. Um, Okay, because they want to make sure that you've at least gone through the process. You don't you don't find out any complications in it. So So most surrogates are mothers? mothers. No, like required to be mothers. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So they have to have at least one successful pregnancy Mm -hmm. themselves Mm -hmm. um, and Including in altruistic cases. Including uh, in altruistic, it can be different, um, but it just once again. So is that something that happens? Like people do an altruistic surrogacy as their first, and then do commercial after? Potentially, okay. um, altruistic surrogacy levels are much lower than people would have you think. Yeah. Because um, I mean, that is a huge investment yeah. and a really intimate, weird relationship. And like in some ways, it would be easier to gestate and bear a child that you don't have to see frequently than one that you know that you carried, but you see, you know, every couple of days from the family. Like right. that's actually a much harder relationship. Yeah. So it happens less frequently. Yeah. Um, so, and to what degree that happens? anyone's guess right? and there's probably like vanishingly few people who like you know submit themselves in like some sort of general population pool of potential altruistic surrogates like yeah you know f- find potential art- altruistic surrogates in new york city like like they don't ex- it yeah. doesn't happen right yeah. which is why they need commercial surrogacy mm-hmm. so yeah so um you once again it's not a federal issue there's there are no laws governing commercial surrogacy on the federal level it's just dealt with on a state by state level um some states ban it only about three ban it um some states are very pro and then a lot of states just have very vague like family law governing it in between so some of these questions are just you literally would have to go to the state and then look at the history of their case law and try to figure out what it is they would do because they don't always have a clear process um but yeah for them but for pretty much in every instance the surrogate has to be a mother at least once has to have naturally birthed the child so typically not a c-section um because they just 
want to make sure all things are good there. Um, yeah. And then she's applying to be a surrogate. Oftentimes there's hopes of having like an intimate relationship with the family. Like I'm doing a good deed to help this family out. Um, but that's certainly not always the case. And it's not always even in the interest of the family to do that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, what other kinds of regulations are potentially put on this? I mean, you've mentioned that California has the most liberal laws of any state. Um, what is what, what are the kinds of restrictions that states have put on it? Yeah, so another good uh, touch point on the opposite end of the spectrum would be Louisiana. So Louisiana only allows uh, commercial surrogacy when the there is a married heterosexual couple who has medically proven infertility um, and then they contract with a surrogate mm -hmm. for a child. Um, but you're talking about the most traditional framework possible. Um, and then they do that through a, a mix of like family law, custody law, and are able to establish parentage mm -hmm. through the courts. Got it. Um, so that would probably be the most quote unquote conservative approach. Um, but there's also states that ban it. And there's some states that ban it. So like, for example, in Michigan, um, though this could change now that Proposition 3 has passed, um, Michigan What's Proposition 3. So Proposition 3 um, was one of the abortion ballot measures that was voted on November 8th uh, this year that effectively said that every individual has a fundamental right to reproductive care, including dot, 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 infertility care. And so when we're talking about commercial surrogacy, um, and this gets on a What's really- What's Michigan Supreme Court like? I have imagined that that's- Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully good, we'll see. When we're talking about commercial surrogacy, while there are not federal or consistent state laws governing it, anytime you see the phrase infertility care, that's just like a red flag buzz. Because what that effectively refers to is IVF and surrogacy, because mm -hmm. surrogacy is considered a part of infertility care, especially if you're a gay man um, or just a man, period, having a child, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so now that Proposition 3 has passed, mm -hmm. which guarantees a fundamental right to infertility care, all they would have to do now is challenge the commercial surrogacy ban in Michigan, and it would likely be overturned because it would be limiting infertility care. <sighs> okay. Um... And just to like terrify people further, Ask yourself, who are the main advocates for expanding commercial surrogacy and redefining infertility, including in Michigan? It's advocacy groups like men having babies and other gay rights groups. Yeah. So this is like a, yeah, it, yeah. yeah. So, okay, um, just one more thing on the surrogates. How, like, I'm assuming that at a certain age, most surrogates kind of cap out, like people aren't contracting 35 year old surrogates. What, what, what does the like end of one's surrogacy career typically look like? And yeah. also, are there any, like, what happens if a surrogate gestates the baby the full nine month term, but the baby dies in childbirth or anything like that? Is there, do they lose out on part of their? money? Like, how does that all work? Yeah. So for age of surrogate, um, once again, this there are n there's no clear guidelines um, or limitations on it. So I've read stories of surrogates who were 40 doing this um, and some as young as like 25. And that's just what I've read about. So some agencies or purchasing parents may want to limit it and say, mm -hmm. well, we only want a surrogate within this age range. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon, though, to have older women who are on like the very upper end of their childbearing years do it. Obviously, the risk is higher and like the chances of success are lower, mm -hmm. um, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. And then um, the second part of your question, uh, what was the second part of your question? Uh, are there any penalties for women who have a baby die in childbirth? Like, yes. what are the contractual ways that money cannot be paid out to them yeah. based on certain things? Yeah. So and then when it comes to this part of the contract, once again, lots of different kinds of yeah. contracts could be done different ways. Yeah. Um, oftentimes the woman would still get the full amount because her job was to bear, was to gestate and then 
attempt to bear the child, mm-hmm. right? So even if the child does die in childbirth or a few days later, she's technically fulfilled her role. Mm-hmm. Um, other contracts um, have like a month by month or like trimester by trimester payment system. Mm. And so if you break it down into four trimesters, three in pregnancy, the fourth being as the baby's being born, what this could mean is she would only get three fourths of the amount promised to her, but not the final installment mm-hmm. because the child wasn't successfully born. Mm-hmm. It's usually done one of those two ways. Mm-hmm. At the various stages of the pregnancy, um, I'm assuming that all of the potential birth defect tests are basically mandatory. So testing for downs and doing mm-hmm. amniocentesis and everything. That w- what typically happens in cases like that is it contractually mandated abortion? Like how does that work? Yeah, so that would be up to the purchasing parents yeah. um, because you're dealing with this because you're dealing with an entire uh, like commercialized process that is there to design and fashion babies according to adult desire, Mm -hmm. even if it's a very genuine desire for children. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when there's uh, some sort of like fetal issue discovered, they will abort the baby. Um, Whether or not that's contract, I think there's part of the contract that would like, once again, the termination of pregnancy, Mm -hmm. that covers any of those issues. And so it doesn't just have to be, there's too many children. It could be, well, the baby has Down syndrome or potentially Down syndrome, Mm -hmm. right? Because those tests are very inconsistent. So that would be covered in the contract and can easily be something that the baby is aborted for. Mm -hmm. Um, And I've read really flippant stories from um, either purchasing parents or surrogates who are like, wow, we've waited like, 10 years to try to conceive a child, but then it came back with a likelihood of Down syndrome, so we had to abort the baby. Isn't that awful? Woe is me. Um, and so like they're bemoaning the loss of money and the loss of time, um, but like still are not thinking about children as gifts to be received, right? But mm. rather commodities to be bought and sold. Yeah, man. Um, all horrific stuff, um, but it gets worse. So um, a big part of the element of the research that you've been focused on is this um, deepening international element mm-hmm. to this. Um, what's going on? Uh, it sounds like China's involved. Tell me the story. Yeah, so it all started um, with the founding of the United States, um, (laughs) as everything that conservative talks about does, um, when we had this thing called birthright citizenship established. So if you're born in the United States, you're a citizen, period. Um, And so in the United States in particular, because of the benefits of citizenship, right, this led to a industry called birth tourism, where women would come from other countries, oftentimes Asia, oftentimes China in particular, in about the eighth month of their pregnancy with the unstated purpose of giving birth in the United States Mm -hmm. so that the child would receive, would gain and maintain all the benefits of citizenship, um, of legal protection, Mm -hmm. of education, um, and as well be a process by which the parents could apply for um, citizenship Mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, So this was a huge issue, something that President Trump actually looked at banning. Say, Say more of how that works, the process by which parents are able to get citizenship because their child was born in the United States. Yes, yeah, so it's through the EB-5 visa. Mm-hmm. Um, and so effectively, when the child turns 21, the parents can then apply for a green card status based on their child's citizenship. Um, and it's seen as a more direct um, and sure path to citizenship. Sorry, not the EB-5 visa, mm-hmm. um, but the green card status is more sure than the EB-5 visa mm-hmm. process, which would require either some sort of business, um, a long process, process of tons of paperwork and money. Mm -hmm. And so if you're looking at like ways of getting citizenship in a country, green card status through your child is far more reliable and is cheaper than something like the EB-5 visa process. Uh And the EB-5 visa process is it's it's the idea is like, you know, to to bring great entrepreneurs to the United States and there's a certain amount of minimum investment you have to do or something. What's that amount typically like? So it's about five hundred thousand okay. minimum. Mm-hmm. Um and you still have to have like something successful to show for it. Mm-hmm. Um so ideally you actually have a good idea behind it, which is incredibly difficult, mm-hmm. right? Um and is a huge investment of time and money. Mm-hmm. Whereas End to end, your typical commercial surrogacy process costs how much? So for international, especially coming from China, you're looking at between two hundred and three hundred thousand. So forty percent savings. Right. Hence this incentive structure. 
how has this actually played out and developed over time? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like I was mentioning, uh, this has then played into a pretty booming uh, birth tourism industry, especially in like the 2010s to 2016. Um, and so President Trump, when he was running, actually looked at finding ways to end birth tourism to make it illegal um, through the birth rate citizenship process. Um, but the Center for Immigration Studies in 2015 actually released a study estimating, and it was a rough estimate because of the limitations on data, that there were about 36,000 children annually born in the United States um, through these birth tourism uh, agreements, effectively. Um, and these are oftentimes women coming from China, uh, like I mentioned earlier. And so one of the ways that the FDA was actually shutting down on this and, and the FBI as well um, through like joint partnerships is that there would be these entire maternity wards in California, for example, where women would come, have the baby and then recover for a month in these like hotels effectively um, that were run by Chinese Americans who spoke the language, who knew the culture. And then once the baby's paperwork birth certificate, social security card, what have you comes back, the parents can just like return to China like it was a travel visa. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the origin of this international commercial surrogacy industry that we're seeing. Um, but in recent years, we've seen a bit of a decline in birth tourism, especially as it's been cracked down upon. But with international commercial surrogacy agreements and our IVF technology, um, a wealthy Chinese national all they have to do is send over either their egg, their sperm, or an embryo. Um, they don't even have to leave China, right? They can just freeze it and send it over to a US-based surrogacy agency. Then that agency can contract with an IVF lab and a surrogate, and then create the child gestated in the surrogate the surrogate can then birth a healthy baby. Um, so full US citizen um, birthing the baby. And once the baby is born, they're also a US citizen. And parents from China don't even have to leave the nation to do this. And then they can just come over and pick up the child from there. Do you want to get more involved with American Moment? Do you want to get off the couch and stop just watching a podcast about the issues you care about? Then you need to go to AmericanMoment.org slash join. If you fill that form out, one of our team members will meet with you and we'll discuss how best to get you involved in politics and public policy here in D.C. Maybe that involves you coming and working at a think tank or a congressional office. Maybe you're in business and it means just holding on for a few years until we get the next presidential administration. Maybe you're a very wealthy person who wants to give us a bunch of money. Either way, go to AmericanMoment.org slash join to meet with a member of our team and get involved more substantively in trying to save this country. It's not enough to listen to podcasts. You actually have to do something. Do they have to pick up the child? Is there a service that just jets the baby over? So technically, best case scenario, surrogacy agencies will say they have to pick up the child, yeah. um, especially when it comes to getting their name on the paperwork. Mm. However, um, during COVID, there was a huge hiccup in the process because countries like China shut down all travel and the United States banned like individuals from China traveling here for a portion of the time too, right? And so there were these subsequent nanny wards that appeared um, where surrogacy agencies were effectively hiring nannies to live in these homes with whatever children were being born. And they were having to change the paperwork to make it legally possible for non-related like just whoever they could find adults to pick up these children from the hospital. So there's this really, um, so a couple of the labor and delivery nurses I spoke to in California um, shared a few stories from the COVID time. One, for example, was an aunt and uncle of one of the women who worked at the surrogacy agency came to pick up another couple's child because they had no one else to do it, to just care for the child. So you hope that these are good parents that are prepared to care for the child, but the child is still not either connected to the surrogate who carried it or the parents who are biologically related, which when it comes to child development um, and those like early months of a child's life, like to lose both of those relationships and just be cared for by a literal third party is incredibly bad for their development. On the worst end of the spectrum, they had one scenario where apparently the agency didn't have anyone to pick up the child, the purchasing parents couldn't come, and they hadn't gotten all the paperwork in place to certify this one man. So there was a man who was like middle-aged, like 40s and 50s, who didn't have the proper paperwork to pick up the child, but still needed to get the child from the surrogate because the surrogate had done their part and was texting the surrogate, asking them to just bring the baby outside 
outside and just give it to him in the car so he could go. The nurses caught wind of this. They shut it down, wouldn't let the surrogate leave. But you're talking about these quote unquote legitimate agencies who didn't have the paperwork in place and were just sending a middle aged man to pick up a newborn baby who he had no connection or relationship to. And we have no idea who this man is. We have no idea where the child is going, right? And this is part of the huge issue with this like international commercial surrogacy agreement, especially with um, Chinese nationals, is that there are no background checks. There's not a medical screening. Um, the state is not clearly tracking who they are, at least not public data. And to the degree that they're even tracking it is still a bit of a question mark because they won't share any of their data. So you don't really know. And so the surrogacy agencies ostensibly know who these people are. But do they really know the motivations? Do they really know why they're purchasing a child? Maybe not. Right. So just in terms of what the balance actually looks like in terms of, in, in terms of incentives, you think about all of the barriers that exist in the adoption system, right? Extremely strict criteria. Parents that try to adopt for years having an exceptionally hard time doing so. It sounds like there's not any of that when it comes no. to surrogacy. So think about the adoption or even foster care process. Yeah. You not only have a long application process, you have background checks, you have home visits, right? You have references of friends and family um, vouching that you're a good person. And you just have a long time meeting with caseworkers. Maybe the background check happens through a commercial surrogacy agency. But there are no home checks. There are no meeting with caseworkers. There are no reference points. None of that is there. So like one of the things that we've sadly joked about is that in some instances, you actually have to do more work to adopt a pet from a shelter in California than you do to purchase a child because they care apparently far more about checking out the mm. home and quality of the parents getting an animal than they do about the parents yeah. purchasing a child. Well, and, and the dark side of this is that with all of those road, let, let's say that you are an earnest but person with means who has the ability to pay for a commercial surrogacy, putting aside the international element for a second, it's the system is almost incentivizing people to go in that direction above and beyond adopting children who might need a good home because yeah. there's so many barriers in place right. in order to prevent that. Um, putting aside active malice, which it sounds like there's some of that as well. What are some of the darkest stories that you've heard uh, whispers of, of what international commercial surrogacy actually results in? Yeah. So the absolute darkest version of this, right, um, is effectively uncovering its relationship with sex trafficking. Um, so in Russia, in Australia in particular, um, there were two giant cases in the last 10 years where they realized that um, children were being purchased through one of these commercial surrogacy means um, for the sake of either child pornography or like child pedophilia rings. Um, so children being created and then rented out to different individuals who had sexual fantasies they wanted to fulfill. And these are very public cases. Um, like, I mean, some of like the most heinous crimes against children that you've ever heard of um, that are possible. On the other hand, there was a really wealthy man in Japan who had um, um, a desire to birth a thousand children, um, but you can't clearly have a wife who births a thousand children. So he was he was paying because he could afford to do so. Um, hundreds of surrogates um, to use an egg, use his sperm, and create children so that he could say he had like a dynasty of a thousand children coming. He didn't succeed in reaching his goal of a thousand. Um, but like, How once many again, did he end up having? A couple, I mean, like literally a couple hundred. But that's what we're talking about, Was right? He raising them? No, of course not. Because like this is ultimately not like the focus is not on the interest and mm -hmm. well being of the children. It's fulfilling some form of uh, of mm -hmm. adult desire. Period. So, well, I I find that interesting because I guess is is cutting and running something that happens much in this business where, um, you know, the prospective surrogate parents disappear and yeah. 
w what happens in that case to the children? Yeah, so in that case, um, and once again, with some of the state regulations, they've been cutting down on this more. Mm. Um, but think like uh, there was a Chinese American, there was a Chinese American actress actually in 2020, 2021, who contracted um, a child um, through commercial surrogacy, and she did not want to carry the child. She didn't want to ruin her form, which is another really vain aesthetic side of this. Um, and so she and her boyfriend contracted a commercial surrogate. Her boyfriend was actually based in China. She was here in the US. Um, but when it came time, about six months into the pregnancy, right, time for the child to be born in that range, uh, she decided she no longer wanted to be a mom. So she just cut her ties with the surrogate and tried to terminate um, she tried to terminate the contract altogether. And so all of a sudden, um, in those instances, the surrogate is left with the child or the boyfriend if he wanted to help. Um, and so there's a couple of times where like, actually there's really high rates of couples that split or get divorces in the middle of a commercial surrogacy contract. That happens way more than people want to talk about because you're dealing in some instances, especially when it's a married couple with like probably a viatal or just like complicated relationship anyway, mm -hmm. if they're going the route of contracting a surrogate rather than bearing children, there's a lot of factors behind that. So you have instances then of that, or you have instances of couples who like create embryos in a lab and then the woman wants to use them, but her husband who she's now divorced from doesn't want children. And so he's like, no, you can't use these conceived children that we froze in a lab. And she's like, no, I have a right to them, they're mine. And then, like the court battle continues. Mm -hmm. um, so you have a couple of different. How does that work, that. by the way? Do, do, do in that exact scenario? Okay, so there's a couple. They're divorced. Um, would one party be able to have that child be born via surrogacy unilaterally? So there's one case um, that the court ruled that because the eggs uh, because the embryo excuse me was frozen with the intent of bearing the child that yes the woman could bear the child um, and the husband then just wanted to be let off the hook from child support or any role in the child's life mm -hmm. um, which is already detrimental for the child's well-being growing up but they did rule in favor of it there are other instances however where they said that because the couple entered into the embryo uh, creation together if they weren't willing to both um, be on board with gestating the child then they couldn't okay. so it leaves these embryos then in, in, in like just in limbo right mm -hmm. um, so depending on the state we've seen like two different rulings but it's never gone beyond like a district mm -hmm. um, case mm -hmm. yeah interesting have there been many instances of the closest thing that you can get to like real designer babies where um, prospective parents have contracted a surrogate and used a selected egg donor as well as a selected sperm donor? This happens all the time. Um, so when it comes to Chinese uh, commercial surrogates uh, or Chinese nationals hiring American surrogates, um, one of the things they talk about is how um, the process of buying an egg, for example, if you're a Chinese American woman who attends an Ivy League school and is even halfway attractive, you can actually charge about 50% more for your eggs than you can for another demographic because there's a high demand for a particular type of egg or a particular type of sperm depending on the situation um, so that happens all the time like this is a market right so like there are certain goods that are prioritized far mm -hmm. more highly so like one of the so, anti-racist so, so what, what, tra what trades at the highest rates just to get really so, like, dark here uh, so the ones that trade at the highest rates and are most popular are going to either be Asian um, and like their background their their school like all of like their information is uploaded from like what did they make on the ACT where are they in college what are they majoring in so Asian eggs perform very highly and then on the other side um, Americans uh, but particularly like blonde hair blue eyed women um, or just like think like the all American like quarterback kind of man like those are the sort of three that are the highest mm -hmm. and so like the best like anti-racist line right like if you're going <laughs> at it is like how many black like egg donors are there out there yeah. not many because yeah. people don't buy them right yeah. same for other minorities like it's in no way like you know a diverse or like woke approved process if you actually get into it yeah which they don't but yeah there's certainly a preference for those for those particular mm. sorts of genetics um but even like a couple of months ago there was a u.s mail story um that talked about 
um, a gay couple uh, contracted a woman. Uh, so they created a few different embryos using eggs they purchased. They selected the embryo that was a male child, put it in the woman. But when the baby was like far enough long to tell the gender, turns out it was a girl. And so they sued the agency company and the surrogate saying, we ordered a male child. We did not pay for a female child and we're going to terminate our um our surrogacy agreement with you because it's not a male. Um, and so this is like easily a form of like sex based um, either gender selection or abortion, right? Because at that point, either the surrogate is left with a child that she did not agree mm -hmm. to raise um, or she has to abort it. And so when it comes to the Chinese nationals, American surrogates, there's this one um, particular medical director at a surrogacy agency called Fertility Now, I think. And he boasted as part of the process of benefits or package of benefits that they offer Chinese nationals is early genetic testing. So he was like, yes, like many Chinese nationals want a son. And so especially when they had the one child rule or even the two child rule, like you got to make the most of it, right, um, is his logic. And so he was like, yes, yeah. so we tell them early on whether or not it's going to be a boy or a girl so that they can, based on abortion, like make a decision about what to do with the fetus. And this is a boasted like benefit that they're offering. The United States doesn't have any laws against sex selective abortion. Uh, no, and especially if you're in California. Because India does, as far as I know. Yeah, India, um, and this is what's so interesting. So like one, California today especially is an abortion sanctuary state mm. you can get an abortion at any point in the pregnancy for any reason mm. um and so it works great with the commercial surrogacy angle mm. when it comes to nations like thailand india nepal um so india for example their com international commercial surrogacy industry used to be a multi-billion dollar business it was one of the ways that like they were rebuilding that it was yeah like making tons of money each of those nations over subsequent times have realized how exploitive the commercial surrogacy process is for the women involved. Mm -hmm. Everything from lack of informed consent, forced C-sections or abortions, not getting the full amount of pay, agencies taking advantage of these women, requiring women to live in housing, like separate from their family for nine months, but like really poor conditions. Like what's what what's that? Uh because they want to be able to monitor the women and ensure that there's nothing uh, that would go against the standards that the agency has boasted. Does that happen much here? Um, they don't typically have housing that they take them from. But once again, Chinese nationals are very traditional people, right? And so one of the problems is that they are very particular. And I mean, if you're spending two to like two to three hundred thousand dollars for a child, of course you're going to be particular about it. So there are instances where surrogates were like, "Yeah, they wanted to put me on bed rest for the last four months of my pregnancy." But they offered to pay my salary, which like as a side note, bed rest is actually not good for you during pregnancy yeah, exactly. at all. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, like the attitude behind this is incredibly like Handmaid's Tale-esque, where these Chinese nationals like have no interest in like really cultivating a relationship with the surrogate. And instead they see the surrogate as like a hireling to do something that they need done. Um, and so one of the quote unquote, pro I mean, actual problems that surrogacy agencies run into is like coaching Chinese nationals on how to speak respectfully to their American surrogates <laughs> because they just treat them like, no, we've paid money, like do the thing we've asked you, this is your contract, do it, and like treat them like hired servants, um, which is very problematic as you can imagine. Yeah. What are the restrictions in China like? Yeah, and this is where it gets worse. Uh, so surrogacy is completely banned in China. Um, mm. What's the story of that? How did that come about? Yeah, so surrogacy has never been allowed in China. Um, the CCP has actually come out in their um, political affairs and legal commission actually condemning commercial surrogacy or any, excuse me, any form of surrogacy for being exploitive of women, commodifying their bodies um, and just being like a very like low, just like a low, low thing to do on like a morality scale. So when the Chinese American that I mentioned earlier uh, abandoned her child after a commercial surrogacy agreement, China actually came out publicly criticizing her um, for what she's done. And so they've never allowed any form of commercial surrogacy. And in 2001, officially passed laws saying that no healthcare provider or researcher could engage in any process that would lead to commercial surrogacy. Um, and so for all of China's human rights, 
rights violations and for all the things they do wrong, they have a very high view of the integrity of their citizens, of the meaning of citizenship, and what it really means to value um, being a Chinese born mm. person. Mm -hmm. um, but legal loopholes between the international side mean that a Chinese national can still work with an American surrogate or an international surrogate. The child would not gain Chinese citizenship per se. There's a process that they could try to achieve it, but the child wouldn't automatically get Chinese citizenship. Um, so that could be a problem later down the road. But as long as you're not applying for benefits or certain positions, you can get away with it. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas in the United States, it's just a free for all, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what it looks like on China's side of it. And they do have some IVF when it comes to married couples. So if the married couple needs to create an embryo, but it goes into the woman, like the mother in the marriage, they have some of that, but their technology is not nearly as advanced as the United States. Um, and so their success rates are really low. Mm -hmm. So once again, they're motivated for better or for worse to get the best bang for their buck and just go international where they have a higher success rate yeah and potentially don't have to bear the child at all right uh, are the chinese the biggest customers of of this internationally at this point they are one of the top customers mm -hmm. so um i have been able to speak to a few surrogacy uh agencies who are willing to uh return my phone call or not leave a nasty message about not wanting to talk to me because apparently <laughs> other work i've done on commercial surrogacy didn't seem as glowing as they were hoping for um and so she this one company it's been around for about seven years now in california she said, yeah, it's crazy. Since COVID, our business has literally tripled. We couldn't have been doing better because once again, the parents don't have to leave the country like they do in birth tourism. So she said their top three, um, like the top three countries they work with, one, they work with domestic in the United States. Um, they work with France because surrogacy is also illegal in France. Um, but she said that about 40% of their customers, 50% of their customers come from China. Um, so you're looking at a majority of that population coming from China. Which the, the variables that would lead to that is one, China just has a massive population. Two, right. it's rapidly becoming wealthier. Three, they ban surrogacy they ban domestically. Surrogacy. And, and four, they have a kind of interesting eugenic view of humanity that very they would, would lead to, you know. Well, and these are some of the weird factors, right? So like very religious China. population. So they don't have any right. like cultural like opposition to it at a, right. at a theological level. Well, and this is what's weird, though. So on the one hand, some polling from China in like 2017 showed that 81 percent of the population was opposed to commercial surrogacy. Um, however, really like the sexual like sexual relationships are rapidly changing right so on the one hand um a large swath of china's population is infertile so they literally don't have the possibility and there are recent studies coming out showing the declining sperm count internationally and some even pointing to the fact that like by 2050 there are some countries that will have large parts of their population unable to naturally conceive because of how low their sperm counts are going and this is a big problem in china it's a big problem in japan but they allow surrogacy um, other instances include single women who want children like i've mentioned or gay men in china whose parents still expect them to produce a child they're expected given their position in society to have one, but are not engaging in any sort of sexual behavior that will lead to a child. Um, so you have instances like that of high rates of them doing it. But two, um, I found quotes of uh, Chinese nationals saying, well, in the coming years, either China's going to be the preeminent nation or the United States is. So it'd be really beneficial if we had kids with US citizenship and then we have Chinese citizenship and whoever comes out on top, that's the nation we'll go with. Right, and that, that's, that's the other interesting layer to it is, you know why maybe the birth tourism is going down is because the goal isn't really to like oh immediately move the entire family over yeah. if you have three hundred thousand dollars of disposable income life in china for you is probably pretty good yeah um you know birth tourism strikes me as something that poorer and middle class people do wealthy right. people with the disposable income to do commercial surrogacy they're doing it as an option maximizing right. opportunity right yeah, yeah that's exactly right yeah mm -hmm. yeah is there any 
appetite in Washington, D.C. to do anything about this or even at the state level? <laughs> uh, yeah. So on the state level, I mean, this is what's so fascinating about the issue and part of why I've wanted to dig into this, even since starting at Heritage, um, is because most a lot of people um, who were engaged just don't know about this process. They don't know what's happening. Right. Um, and so part of it is just literally raising awareness and being like, hey, turns out commercial surrogacy exists. Like I called a researcher. I mean, you've had you've explained it to me twice now and I've still like my yeah. jaw's been on the floor both no, times. <laughs> I, I have talked to I've talked to other researchers in DC. I've I've done like media hits on this, right? And people will be like, wow, surely people can't pay another person to produce a child for them. And I'm like, yes, indeed, <laughs> this is actually happening. And so like even people who are well engaged, I, I don't think recognize the extent of it. On the other hand, you have a lot of groups, the sympathetic left, um, even conservative Christians who are actually very in favor of this process because they think of it through the lens of the altruistic framework, which is once again, a minority of surrogacy like agreements in the United States um, and don't actually realize this very dark and very problematic underbelly. Um, and so to the degree that people even know about it. There is certainly interest. Um, but the problem is, and this is the problem with all of our technological developments, especially in the transhumanism space, mm -hmm. is that we haven't actually stopped to ask, is this good? Mm -hmm. And should we progress? Mm -hmm. Most academic papers, most policy discussions are, we can do this thing, therefore mm -hmm. we should. So what is the best way of going about mm -hmm. it? There's no real consideration about the implications of this. Mm -hmm. um, and so once again, I mentioned like the fertility care or infertility mm -hmm. care being a buzzword. Um, there are there was a bill um, put forward this summer in the House, it didn't pass, that was pushing to redefine infertility to move beyond the medical definition of 12 months of unprotected sex without conception, which is what most medical boards consider, to include things like one sexual preference. So if you're two gay men having sex and you can't get pregnant, which is just shocking to me, you're infertile, or based on your relationship status. So if you're a single woman who doesn't have a viable option in her life, uh, you can- Or an incel. <laughs> right, exactly, or an incel, you can be infertile. Um, and so that was a federal bill and they wanted to provide very generous IRS deductions um, to cover the cost of IVF and surrogacy based on this redefinition of infertility. Illinois has actually redefined infertility along those lines in recent years. Um, so you're seeing state level and federal level pushes on that side of things. But once again, that's just a permissive, we can, therefore we should mentality. Mm -hmm. um, there are far fewer individuals who are actually saying, oh, maybe this is not a good process. And like the distinction here that's important to make is like technology is a good thing. Our technological developments like are a gift from the Lord. They're a sign of human flourishing. Um, but you have to be able to distinguish between good technological development and poor. And so when it comes to um, commercial surrogacy and IVF, the framing I like to have, and that's at least being had in certain circles of conversation, typically and very like conservative ones, as you can imagine, is this idea of are we restoring fertility or are we trying to distort and just do away with the process altogether? Mm. So a good example of these conversations would be um, a medical procedure that actually goes down to the cellular level in a woman and tries to literally restore her fertility, find the part of the, the egg, the cell that's not working and fix it um, via a very delicate uh, medical procedure such that her eggs that were either not viable or she didn't have enough of would uh, would work and so she could have a child. Mm -hmm. um, for example, Saudi Arabia, who also bans all form of commercial surrogacy, um, focuses on this kind of research because they want to enable uh, men and women through the natural process that God has given them mm -hmm. to have children. Mm -hmm. um, Is surrogacy prohibited under Islam? Uh, under Islam, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but certainly in Saudi Arabia and mm -hmm. other countries. Yeah. Uh, sorry, other Muslim countries in particular. Mm -hmm. And then like the negative side of it would be this kind of making of a child that doesn't try to fulfill the natural order, right? And just totally does away with it to enable unnatural means. So like gay and lesbian couples, single individuals, older couples, for example, to have children that they may not be fit to have. Um, the worst example of this being a man in California, once again, who was deaf, 
um, could only see from one eye and was a postal worker, but because of their lax laws was able to literally create and contract three different children from a surrogate and then decided halfway through that he couldn't afford all three, so wanted to require her to abort one. She refused and kept the child. And then the children were literally being raised in squalor um, because he didn't have the money or the ability to care for them. Um, just like horrible instances of like, clearly this is not looking for the good of the child at all. Um, so there's those sorts of conversations happening on the federal level. Um, but once again, very few of them are really thinking about this in a restorative way. Um, and the interest is really just how much can we do with the technology we have. Mm -hmm. um, but that falls into all of the genetic testing, genetic manufacturing, designer baby industry um, that is so problematic and contrary to what a natural conception of having children should look like. Mm -hmm. Um, there's an Anglican ethicist um, who actually wrote this in the 80s talking about the uh, nature of begetting versus making. And so he argued that to beget something, um, so man and a woman begetting a child, is to make something in your own image. So God created the world, um, but he beget Christ, right, in his own image. But when it comes to commercial surrogacy and IVF, you're no longer begetting children through a natural process. You're actually making them. And to make something is to make something that's unlike yourself, that changes the nature of your relationship to them, to the degree that it could actually fundamentally change the way we think about what it means to be a human, what we think it means to bear children, and even our relationship with future generations. Mm -hmm. Well, that was horrifying. <laughs> I, I, I it's, it, it's, it's again. It was just one of the most shocking things I'd ever heard, and um, I'm really excited to see uh, the subsequent work you do on this. How can people keep up with with everything you're writing and researching when it comes to this topic, Emma? Yes, yeah, so they can follow me at theheritagefoundation.org, Emma Waters, um, or on Twitter at eml waters. Very good. Um, there's an American Mind piece that was sort of your first mm -hmm. salvo on this. We'll link it in the description, um, but very much looking forward to hearing more about it. Uh, and thank you for coming on the show to um, make my Friday a lot more depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me back on. I have a moral obligation to encourage you not to drive off of whatever bridge that you're um, on after listening to that episode of Moment of Truth. It really is just an absolutely wild, wild, wild uh, policy area. Hopefully you um, are motivated to do something about it now that you've heard this horrific tale. Go follow Emma on social media so that you can keep up with everything that she's writing on this. Please go rate and review this podcast, uh, Moment of Truth here, um, so that you can find out everything. Um, uh, or you can help us uh, make this podcast more popular. Season three is going to be full of awesome stuff. Uh, thank you, as always, for listening, guys. Uh, we see this as one of the best use cases for the podcast. But this episode on the one prior, you know, Catherine Stevens was launching a new organization, and we were able to help publicize a little bit using this show. Emma's writing something fantastic about a very, very niche policy area. This is what we do this for, is to make sure that we can send it out to a couple thousand of you that are involved in public policy and, and really uh, advance that um, the awareness when it comes to important issues and important organizations. Thank you, as always, for listening, and we will see you guys next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more. Mm -hmm.